Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tradition Kitchens. I'm Julia. I'm so happy to see you here for Sustainable Seafood Stew with Andy and the Agricultural Institute of Marin. Really, really excited for today's class. And we have about 35 of the 136 people we are expecting. And if you are new to Tradition Kitchens, welcome. If you've been here before, I see many familiar faces up on the Zoom. It's really nice when we are beginning introductions and meeting one another to be on gallery view. So you can select speaker, gallery, and it's wonderful. It's Brady Bunch style, and you get to see all the people who are joining. Tell us in the chat where you are calling in from. Our classes have become international. We've had folks from England, Ireland, Singapore, Malaysia, the US, Canada. Tell us where you are calling in from. I want to welcome Marianne from Vermont. Thomas is from Canada. Happy to have you here. And I see some returning folks on the call as well. Definitely turn on your camera. We have a fun kitchen cam where we go around and we take a look at who is joining us and we ask you to unmute and introduce yourselves. So we love learning about all the people who are joining us as if we are hanging out in each other's kitchen. So Penny, I think you might have been one of the first ones on the call. I'm just wondering if you would like to unmute and I can spotlight you and you could tell us where you're calling in from. I love your title, Master Gardener. Tell us more <laughs> and make sure you unmute. On the bottom left, I've pre-muted everyone to make sure we don't have any background noise and we can focus on learning from Andy. So if you're on a computer or an iPad, it should be on the left-hand side. Um, there we go. Okay. There. What's that? <laughs> hey, um, my name is Penny and this is my husband, Paul. And uh, we're in uh, Olympia, Washington in the United States. He's a beekeeper and I'm a master gardener. So we do a lot of projects together and we help train some of the local master gardeners in pollinator gardens and you know how to keep your bees healthy that are all over. Even if you don't keep beehives, they're there. So you might as well know if you're impacting them or not. And my husband signed up for this because I love this kind of seafood stew, but he doesn't. He doesn't like the tomato base. But he did this for me because, because he's a cool guy. So that's why we're here to learn how to do this. Wow, what a cool guy. We should all give uh, him some emoji appreciation, heart claps. <laughs> that is so fun. And your, your role as master gardener and beekeeper, that is so, so cool to hear about. Yeah. I, I want to know more. What does it mean? How are you a master gardener? What would... Uh, um, we go through a lot of training that each each um, state in the United States has a land college where they have funds where they can uh, help train master gardeners to go out and share our experience with the public. Um, not commercially, but just like your home gardens or your flower beds or whatever. And then we we give classes or, um, you know, go to farmers markets or wherever people are. We just make ourselves available and answer questions and help them get more in tune with what they're growing and why and to love it. So that's what we do. That is so cool. I thank you so much for joining us. Really sure. excited to learn with you and sharing your story is so special. So thank you, thank you. Great to connect with you all. Want to welcome people who are joining us. We're at 47 attendees. Please flip on your video so we can meet you and say hello and learn a bit about each other's stories. We'll do one or two more intros before we officially kick off. I'm Julia. Welcome on behalf of Tradition Kitchens. I see a few of our past teachers on the line. So shout out to Karan Phillips, who's here cooking with Karan. Uh, let us know if you've been to her class before. I also wanna um, head over to Janet, who's in the neighborhood where um, Andy is based and, um, and just say hello and introduce yourself, please, if you could. Sure, hi everyone, this is Janet. I'm in Hayward, California, just across the couple of bridges from Marin County and um, not a uh, not at cooking along so that's a little bit of mess in the background but love tradition kitchens classes it's been great this whole um, pandemic time period to be able to enjoy the different presentations 
Um, I am more of a baker than a cook, so I'm more sweet than savory, but seafood and stew sounds really great, particularly with the rain coming down. It's perfect timing. So um, otherwise, I'm a master food preserver through uh, University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources here uh, in California. So great program and um, Love to make jams and jellies. That's what everyone's getting for the holidays. So if you're not on my list, send me your address because I make more than anyone could ever possibly consume. So looking for new friends. <laughs> oh Thank my you. goodness, Janet, what a kind offer. I feel like you might have a lot of friends on this call. So that's okay. I'm here for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Andy, you might have a future farmer's market volunteer. Uh, Janet put her name in to uh, help support the great work you lead. Uh, so just want to make sure you know of her and all the awesome work she can, has been doing and, and could do to help out your great organization. That's great. All right. I think we're going to do one more uh, intro. Would anyone um, like to say hello and let us know where they're calling in from? I'll kind of make it um, open, so raise your hand or feel free to unmute as I take a look across. We've got 50 folks on the line, so really excited to have all of you here. Let's see, I might pick on someone that I recognize. It looks like Janet Charles, you might be waving. Is that a wave? Do you want to say hello? Yes, all right. yes, yes. I, I didn't realize I was going to be on film. I didn't do my stage makeup, but um, yeah, I'm, I, I know Andy from his uh, USDA days, enjoyed him very much when we worked together. I'm now retired and uh, enjoying Andy's posts on Facebook and have been admiring his food as well as his work. And so uh, I have a little fish store here in Olympia, Washington. Hello, my, my neighbor Penny, um, that we get sometimes some fish stew makings from, but I'd like to be able to make it myself. And I'm just watching today. That's amazing. I love that. I also enjoy following along on Andy's social media adventures. They are really fun. Um, so, so happy to have friends of Andy's and future friends of Andy's and the Agricultural Institute of Marin. Um, we're about seven minutes after the hour. And so I want to officially kick us off. Thank you again to all of you for joining from around uh, the country and also Canada. Please let us know in the chat if you have not yet um, where you're calling in from. Tradition Kitchens is all about building community and creating connections through food. We love learning about each other's cultures and customs. And one of the nicest ways to do it is as if we're hanging out in each other's kitchens virtually on Zoom. Um, before we officially kick off our classes, we like to take a selfie. It's our Zoom selfie. So if you haven't turned on your video, flip that switch. Um, and get ready to smile. I'm gonna count us down and imagine I'm Ellen DeGeneres at the Oscars. Instead of holding up a cell phone, I'm getting ready to take a screenshot. So welcome Jan and uh, Jane and Stan from San Mateo. Hey, Natasha, good to see you from Boston. Thomas flipping on the camera. I'll call out a couple names, Alyssa, Jackie, Arlene, Catherine, uh, Romy. If you wanna join us, we'd love to see one video for our selfie. All right, looks like we have as many people as possible. If you wanna experience the selfie fun, um, definitely do gallery view, it's awesome. So I'm gonna count us down, everyone smile. Three, two, one. Amazing, yeah, Karan, keep that camera on, girl. All right, three, two, one more. Beautiful, I love it. Everyone's smiles really light up uh, the classes. So I hope you keep your video on because we really like to meet each other. We understand everybody's in different places and this is my fake kitchen. I have about 20 of them that I have created over uh, this time at home. And quickly before we get started, I just wanna say thank you to all of you who have contributed. Um, this is one of our cooking for a causes classes. So we're picking um, once a month, a chef who's teaching with us can select a cause that matters to us and we collectively uh, donate together. So we've raised $290 for the Agricultural Institute of Marin, which is amazing. Thank you so much to those who have given. Any amount is appreciated um, that you want to contribute. We'll keep the fundraiser open for the next day. And thank you in advance for uh, supporting farmers markets, sustainability, and uh, the great work that 
Andy's going to talk to us about tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Andy for the incredible cooking lesson that we're going to have with him. But first, I have to say it's just such a wonderful honor to learn from you uh, this evening. Well, I'm based in Atlanta, so it's a little later for me, earlier evening for you in California. Andy and I went to college together and uh, live on opposite coasts, but have kept in touch. And I just have always admired his commitment to community and food and health. And I'm just so honored that you're joining us and the great work that you lead. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much, Julia and everyone for joining us. Um, it's great to be together tonight. And even in times of uh, social distancing, cooking is what really can bring us together. So I'm glad to be here tonight. So you're actually, we're in my home kitchen. Uh, I'm, I live in San Rafael, which is in Marin County, California, just about 20 miles north of San Francisco. And uh, I'm really delighted to share uh, some of my favorite recipes with you, sustainable seafood stew. And I'm going to talk a lot about the importance of shopping locally and sustainably and what that means and how we can actually eat for better nutrition, but also for a better climate. Um, as I go through the lesson, uh, please follow along, uh, enjoy, ask questions. Um, this is my first time with Tradition Kitchens and I've taught many different classes before, but this is actually the first time I'm teaching a cooking class. Um, I love cooking. I share it a lot quite on Instagram and social media. And thanks, Janet Livingston. You followed me yesterday on Instagram. I feel like a little celebrity. So um, honored to be here with you today. But before I start, one thing I wanted to share is that um, one of the most important things in my kitchen is actually my compost bin. Um, it's really important to me that with any meal that I try my best to have no waste. So any food scraps that can't be used, I do put in compost and other items I try to reuse as well. So we'll talk more about creating a seafood stock and other types of ingredients. So if you're just joining us now, I'm Andy Najaris with the Agricultural Institute of Marin. Uh, for short, we go by AIM and AIM is a California nonprofit that works to inspire, educate and connect communities with responsible farmers and producers as part of a healthy, earth-friendly, equitable local and regional food system. So. The way we do that is by operating nine year-round farmers markets. We have a network of about 400 small-scale farmers, fishers, ranchers, and food makers that come from 43 of the 58 California counties to sell their products directly to the public. Um, we also work to ensure food access by operating uh, food stamp or EBT programs. We give a market match. So for every $15 spent at the farmers market, we give a matching $15. Um, for free fruits and vegetables that all goes back into the pockets of the farmers, along with a variety of uh, food access, education, and policy initiatives. Um, so everything I'm talking about today comes from this focus of climate smart and, and sustainable eating. So not only can we eat to um, nourish ourselves, nourish our bodies, but also to nourish and heal the planet. So if you're following along at home, uh, what I'm cooking with today is I'm using my Dutch oven. I'm gonna kind of rotate my camera a bit so you can see different things. Um, so I'll do most of the cooking in my Dutch oven. And then we're also gonna be uh, doing a lot of chopping and prep together. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna start with, uh, the first thing we need to do is one of my favorite ingredients is butter. Um, butter, I believe makes everything better, um, especially when we are using organic butter. So this particular butter that I use is from a local dairy called uh, Strauss Family Creamery. They're a dairy that's based here in Marin County. And we're gonna start with four tablespoons of butter. So you wanna make sure that your Dutch oven or, or pot is, you have some heat going. Um, so about low to medium heat. And we're gonna drop it in and let our butter start melting. And one of the interesting things about Strauss Family Creamery is that they use sustainable organic practices. So they're certified, which means that they don't provide additional pesticides on the grass that the cows eat. The other thing that they do as well is they actually have a program called carbon farming, or what that means is that they apply healthy compost in their soils. And as cows are grazing, they're actually able to sequester or trap carbon emissions in the soil. So what that means is that their production methods can actually help to reverse the climate crisis. 
they're also, they develop an interesting partnership where they, their cows uh, produce methane or, or cow farts. Sorry to use that language while we're cooking together, but um, they're actually able to use that methane to power the farm. They've also formed a partnership with a car company, BMW, where they're now able to start powering BMWs using a cow methane emissions. So uh, interesting little factoid. But um, so just you can see, I've got a little sizzle going with my butter. Um, I like to see that nice golden butter. But what we're gonna do next to get things started is we're gonna begin by looking at some of our vegetables that we're adding. So the first thing we're gonna add is our leek. Um, I'm gonna tell a lot of really bad jokes. So I encourage you to laugh along with me. So I, I love leeks because I love the flavors, but also I like jokes about leeks when I say, oh no, there's a leak in the kitchen. We better call the plumber. <laughs> um, I, I laugh at myself. Uh, my husband laughs at me. My dog is around too, so he'll, they'll find some entertainment. So this is a, an organic leek that comes from a local farm. And one of the first things that we're gonna do is we're gonna slice the leek. It's very important with leeks that you um, only use the white and green part of it. You're gonna cut off, or sorry, the white and the yellow part. You're gonna cut off the, uh, the large greens. We're not gonna use that. We are gonna put that into compost today. So just gonna show you as I start slicing my leeks. So, um, I'm going to cut off the ends and then cut off the top part as well, the greens. I'm putting this into my compost bin. And then we're just going to do some really thin slices. Um, this is going to go right into our Dutch oven and it's going to be cooked in the butter. And I like leeks because they are, um, they have a similar flavor to an onion. Um, I almost find a little bit of a nutty taste to them as well, but um, I really do enjoy the flavors of leeks. They're a great base for a stew. Um, I'm using leeks and shallots rather than onions tonight. So we're gonna keep doing some thin slicing. Andy, I'm admiring your, your knife skills. And also that's a very interesting shaped knife. It's like fully square. It's yeah, so it's, um, no, thanks for pointing that. So one thing with knives is that I always have my index finger on the top um, and then I hold my knife um, around here. Um, kind of like how you're holding a tennis racket, but you stick your finger up. Just makes it for really nice, easy slicing. One thing you wanna make sure is that with your knives is that you keep them really sharp. Um, so if you don't have a home sharpener to go to a local hardware store, we have them at the farmer's markets where we're able to have um, knife sharpeners on site. Um, knife sharpening is one of the really key essential items for uh, effective cooking. So you can see my, my butter's getting nice and brown. I'm gonna stir it just a little bit. Um, and as you're stirring, a question from Elisa, um, can we substitute onions if we don't have leeks or shallots? Not a problem. You can do onions as well. Um, I would do about like one medium sized white or yellow onion. Um, this is gonna become the base of the stew. So it, it's really okay. As long as you have something, an onion or a leek um, or shallots, it'll add that uh, nice oniony, peppery flavor. So we're gonna start with putting in some of our shallots into the butter and mix it a little bit. Um, so I'm actually cooking with an electric stove top and electric stove tops tend, the heat runs really high. So it's very important to, to make sure you're monitoring it. Um, I'm also gonna add a little drizzle of olive oil too. And I'm using, this is an organic olive oil from another one of our local farms called Triple T. Uh, Triple T farm is actually based in Sonoma County. Uh, interestingly enough, um, or sadly enough, their farm actually uh, burnt down um, in one of the recent fires that we had in Sonoma called the Glass Fire that was back about two years ago. And uh, fortunately, with their irrigation, their farm was able to uh, continue operating, but they lost all of their structures. Um, so they're, they're back in business at our farmer's markets and a great family that runs their farm. So we've started with the leeks. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start adding our shallots. So similar to an onion, um, a shallot is very much a cross between garlic as well as um, an onion. So let me grab my shallot right now. 
So with a shallot, um, again, similar to how we slice a leek. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take off the outer edge, the skin of the shallot. I'm gonna peel that here. Sorry, just use your fingers to peel that a little bit. Um, so as we're done peeling, almost there, one second. Um, so here we have our shallot. And one thing with the shallot is, um, usually they come with two bulbs inside. So I do like to use both of them. Um, I get really impacted by uh, chopping onions and shallots. So I, I may start crying in a bit, but um, what I like to do is I'll pull them apart and then I'll go and do a couple slices down the middle and then a couple across this way as well, um, just to get a nice little even dice. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just going right in the stew. So we're gonna throw that in there as well. And Andy, do you have a recommendation of how large the pot should be that you that you use? I mean, this pot is about, I think it's about uh, 64 ounces. Um, anywhere from like 32 to 64 ounces should be fine. So we're gonna keep chopping the shallots. So they're all diced and then putting it back into the pot. So I'm gonna swing that over here so you can see that as well. It's getting a nice, um, it's getting tender. Um, you can see again, I like, the smell's really important. That's one thing while you're cooking is to really focus on using all your senses. So obviously sight and touch, but also smell. So I really like just breathe in the smell. It's, it's something that will clear up your sinuses, uh, might make your eyes tear a little bit, but um, it's just nice to and enjoy and understand what good food smells like. Um, we're gonna keep stirring this for a bit. Um, I'm also going to add some salt and pepper as well. Let me grab my salt and pepper. The butter I used was unsalted. So um, I like salt. I'm a, I'm a big salt fan. Um, not too much. I don't want to get, I don't want to have a heart attack, but just enough to bring out the flavor. But um, what we do, uh, we're just going to keep mixing things together. Um, overall, you're going to want things to simmer or saute for about 15 minutes. Um, so I've been like roughly tracking things. It's been about five minutes so far. Um, but you can see that it's really starting to uh, get nice and tender. Um, I usually know that it's done when things are starting to get translucent. Um, so keep giving a little stir. Um, given that it's butter, things just you generally don't have to worry about sticking. Um, however, if let's say you were cooking and you notice that the bottom started to get brown, um, if it started to get glazed. Um, oftentimes that will occur if it's your pan is too hot. One thing that you can do is that later on is you can deglaze it um, and you can deglaze it by pretty much adding any liquid. So when you do, we're gonna add our liquid soon and that will deglaze the bottom of the pan. And that's often where like the really good flavors are. So if you have your onions or your leeks, things will start to caramelize at the bottom. And when you deglaze it, it really releases those really rich flavors. So uh, we're gonna keep sauteing this for a bit. Um, and as people are going along, feel free to ask any questions in the chat um, or, or other things that come to mind as you're going through this. But if you're using onions, um, you, can, you would do the exact same process with the onions too. So it's really no different than cooking with leeks. So we're gonna keep cooking. Um, my heat's on about like a little below medium. Um, I didn't want to make it at medium because again, my, my stove top as an electric stove does tend to run hot. So while we're uh, continuing to let the uh, leeks and shallots saute, we're going to next focus on uh, our garlic. So I'm going to pull up the garlic. So I have uh, four different cloves of garlic. Uh, we're gonna mince these. And one of the ways to make garlic really easy to mince, I used to really not like prep preparing garlic, but uh, one of the things that you can do that makes it really easy is actually just make your knife flat and you're actually gonna put your palm on it and you're gonna press down on the garlic. Um, that's actually one of the easiest ways to get it out of the peel. So um, just comes right out. 
Look at that, it's like magic. Um, so here's my first garlic clove. My second one that came right out of the peel. Let me grab it. two more. There's somewhere on my countertop. One second. Uh, here we are. Uh, these are also uh, organic garlic. Um, I try my best to predominantly buy organic foods. Um, it's something that's an important value for me. It's also really important when it comes to, again, protecting the earth and farm workers. Um, foods that are, uh, that come with pesticides that contributes to additional exposures among farm workers. Um, and that can contribute to a whole variety of uh, exposures, toxic chemicals and um, unhealthy work conditions. So I really try to focus on uh, organic as much as possible to protect farm workers, as well as to protect the planet. Um, that's left chemicals that are running off into streams, um, into our water supply and so forth. Um, so we've got all of our organic peels. Um, I want to do a little stir of my leeks and shallots. Um, so chopping garlic is, is fun for the most part. Um, so you're going to get your garlic ready. And what I like to do first is just slice it with some really gentle slices. I know a lot of people do the claw. I'm like really bad with the claw. So it's something I, um, I just like don't do it. So I'm like, I'm probably going to chop my finger off at some point. Um, I already lost a thumb to cancer, so I'm hopeful I won't use any others, but I'm doing my best. Um, so I'm gonna just do some chopping first. And then what I like to do is then bunch all of my garlic together and just do a rocking motion. So just gently rock the knife and that helps to really get it nice and minced. So I'm not pushing hard at all, just a gentle rock up and down until I get my garlic nice and minced. So it's a little too big for me. Um, but you add the garlic at the end because if you put it in too soon, it's actually gonna burn. So we're gonna put it at the end of sauteing. So this looks good enough. Um, so let's go back to looking at the, uh, the leeks and the shallots. I'm gonna give it another little stir. So it's looking really good. Uh, it's getting some brown color that's from the butter. And then we're going to go and put in the garlic as well. And we're going to add the minced garlic and we're going to leave it in for about, about two to three minutes. Um, you want to cook it enough so you start to really again uh, smell the flavors of the garlic, but not too much because you don't want it to burn. One thing as well, as I mentioned about organic as part of a healthy planet. So foods that are certified organic in the US have to go through a federal program called the National Organic Program. And there are very specific standards and very rigid standards as far as how farmers and producers can demonstrate that they're meeting the organic requirements. There are other international organic programs soon. I'm very curious for those outside the US to understand your experience with organic as well. Um, but tonight I'm gonna to be talking mainly about the USDA national organic program. Um, you'll see on foods that are sold organic, there's package, there's a symbol that says USDA, or that you'll see uh, foods at the farmer's market, there's a sign that says uh, organic certified. And that way you know that someone's done the work as a certifier to say that there's no uh, synthetic uh, chemicals or pesticides that are added. So I'm letting this simmer. It smells great in here. I have the wonderful smell of the garlic and the leek and the butter. My window's open behind me. With I can hear the sound of the rain coming down. I'm just, it really just feels like a perfect night. So it's been about, um, let's say two minutes or so. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna do next is we're gonna get ready to uh, start making the base of our stew. And one of the things with making a stew, so um, the question is, well, what's a stew? How is a stew different than soup? Well, uh, a soup is just any type of um, 
food that's cooked in liquid. Um, you can have a cold soup or a hot soup. Um, a stew is really intended to be a, a hearty meal where you're actually cooking the ingredients. So in this case, the farmer's market veggies, as well as the fish directly in the liquid. Um, so that's what constitutes a stew. There's also, you may have heard of a cioppino. Um, that's an Italian American type of stew that has a tomato base and wine. Then there's a bisque, which oftentimes you'll hear like a lobster bisque or a seafood dip bisque, where there's a puree of sometimes the shells of seafood or other types of, um, other types of seafood or fish products. Um, but I like a stew. That tends to be like something that I really like. So one of the things that we're gonna do now is again, start making uh, the actual base of our stew. So we're gonna start with some tomatoes. Um, so you can use uh, fresh tomatoes. Um, tomato season is pretty much uh, over at this point. We have some, long, some late season tomatoes, but um, one of the things that I like to do is uh, several of our farmers, they will uh, take their tomatoes that they grow on their farms and then produce products with them. So in this case, these are crushed tomatoes that are produced by um, Jennifer and Matthew Sims of Sims Organic. They're a, a farm based in uh, Half Moon Bay that are part of our farmer's markets. They have beautiful crushed tomatoes um, that I really enjoy the flavor of. And it's nice when you get tomatoes that are crushed or diced um, when they're in peak season because it preserves the fresh peak flavor um, from the summer harvest. So we're gonna add this to our stew. Then the nice little sizzle. Um, I'm gonna give that a little stir. I'm also going to use, I have, um, so that was a 16 ounce can of crushed tomatoes. I also have some organic diced tomatoes with some fire roasted, uh, I feel like I'm in like a magic show right now. Like, woo, look, what ha, ta-da. But um, anyway, there's a lot of steam coming out. Um, so I'm gonna add some of my diced tomatoes as well. I love the magic show look on you, Andy. It's a great I know, right? Um, that's basically what cooking is. Like most of the time, I really don't know what I'm doing. And I like put everything together. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is food that's, that's edible and I'm gonna enjoy it. Um, so I've added in my tomatoes together. Um, if one of the things you can do is actually to get summer season tomatoes. And then when you can, um, you can actually store it. You can can it, you can preserve it. We have uh, Janet, our master preserver. So if you wanna share how to preserve tomatoes, that'll be great. But um, if you are using your own tomatoes, I do encourage that you um, peel them and uh, core them as well before you actually uh, store them. But um, so I'm mixing my tomatoes together. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, let's see. Did we put in the celery yet? I don't think so. The celery? Yeah. No, that's coming soon. Okay. And that's then- That's so important because I always forget the celery. I'm glad you reminded me. <laughs> don't forget it. Um, don't. Someone has a tomato allergy. Do you have a suggestion for a substitution? Oh, a tomato allergy. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know, actually, maybe someone else joining us tonight would know. Um, I mean, I guess you could do a cream-based one instead. You could do more of a chowder. Um, or you could, I mean, you could potentially forgo the tomatoes and just do the stock. Um, it won't have that rich tomatoey flavor, but um, I'm not sure. Okay. And then one last thing. I, uh, we see that you're covering and uncovering the pot. Yeah. Um, any reasons why? Oh no, I actually haven't covered the pot at all. We're gonna be doing, oh. um, I, it, the, the pot is totally uncovered at this point. It might just be like the, the magic smoke that makes yeah, it. Yeah, that's it, that's it, okay, um, <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna add some of the stock. So we're gonna do two and a half cups of, of seafood stock. So um, we're gonna pour this in. What's really interesting about um, seafood stock is that at the end of our recipe, some of the uh, byproducts we have left over, like the shells from the shrimp, um, some of the skin, you can save and put in the freezer to make a seafood stock. So uh, don't let food go to waste. You can reuse it. Um, same things with the top of the celery. Uh, I'm also going to use uh, about a cup of uh, chicken broth as well. Um, I like using a mix of stock and chicken broth. It just gives really uh, rich, interesting flavors. Um, Again, it's the magic of cooking. I don't know why it works, but it seems to work. 
So, uh, so we're gonna add these together, uh, give it a nice little stir. Let me tilt the camera um, so you can see it's uh, coming together well. We're gonna start turning up the heat because we're gonna boil this very soon. Um, we're also gonna add to our stock, we're gonna take one bay leaf. Oh, where did I put my bay leaf? I wonder if it blew away when I had the window open. Oh, here it was, it was hiding. Look, magic, voila, the bay leaf. We're also gonna add a half a teaspoon of thyme. Um, so if someone says, do you have any thyme? Yes, it's right here. LOL, and laughing, laughing, lots our, of laughs. <laughs> you didn't realize you were getting food and a comedy show. And um, a magic show, all three. Show, like a three. For <laughs> so we're gonna mix this all together and then we're gonna turn up the heat and then we're gonna let it get to a boil. So just give it some nice stir. You want to have everything together. So I did, um, I did use a half a teaspoon of dried thyme. I also used one bay leaf. Um, I prefer to use dried spices as part of the base of a, a stew. Um, I find that it really helps to intensify the flavors. Later on, we are going to add some fresh parsley but um, I do prefer the flavors of dried spices for the base of the stew. Um, the thyme that I'm using as well as the bay leaf also comes from a local farmer uh, called All Star Organics uh, owned by uh, Marty and Janet Brown. Um, they're local farmers here and they've actually developed a commercial kitchen on their farm where they take the, uh, the crops that they grow and then turn them into a specialty uh, salt, spices and other types of herbs. So you can enjoy them all year round. So we're um, we're stirring things up. Um, I like the color; it's, it's reddish. Um, the little black areas that's actually from the fire roasted uh, diced tomatoes. Um, it's nothing to be concerned about. Uh, I like the flavor of uh, fire roasted tomatoes. So this is all heating up. Uh, we want to get this to a boil, and then once it boils, then we're going to start uh, a simmer. Uh, for about 10 minutes. And then a question about the um, the broth. One is, can you add some wine to it if you're feeling it? And then two, does it ever um, get low um, and should you replenish it with more stock? How do you know if it's the right amount? Yeah, I mean, oh, you could definitely add a wine, a wine to it. I would say like, you know, maybe like a half a cup or a quarter cup of, um, I would probably do a, a dry white wine. Um, and again, that's actually the basis if you're doing a chipino, where you would add um, wine to it. I think as far as the stock goes, um, we've added a fair amount of liquid um, between the tomatoes. So we have 32 ounces of tomatoes with juice. We have about three and a half cups of stock. So we have a good amount of liquid in here. Um, however, if, if you were getting concerned or if you thought the ratio of vegetables and fish to stock was too high, you could certainly add in more liquid. But um, so now we can see it's starting to boil. Um, so I'm gonna lower my heat for a simmer right now. So let me go do that. And Andy, if you're able to answer in between, if it's not too distracting, where did this recipe come from? Um, so it's just, I've, I kind of just read a lot of different recipes on the internet. Um, and what the way I approach cooking is like, I don't really like to follow recipes exactly. So I'll just like pick up different methods and ingredients that I enjoy. So I kind of just took bits and pieces over the years of making stews. And um, this is what I like. Um, the nice thing too, when we get to the, the seafood is that um, the seafood I'm, I'm using are just types of seafood and fish that I like. You can really use any vegetables, any seafoods. Um, cooking is really, a, it's, a, it's a blank palette. So um, anything we're doing tonight um, with the exception of butter, because butter is the basis of, of all good cooking, um, you could swap out, well, I guess the tomatoes too. Um, okay, so what we're doing, we're gonna let this simmer for about 10 minutes. And while we're doing that, we're gonna get the rest of our veggies ready. So, uh, 
we're going to be adding tonight. Um, this is what I enjoyed adding. Um, so we're going to do some celery. We're going to do some carrots and we're going to do some potatoes. Um, the funny thing about celery, there, there's like funny things about celery. Um, so this is actually a stalk of celery and this is a rib. But when you're cooking with celery and a recipe says add a stalk of celery, it's actually just a rib. So it's one of those things in the English language that's just like we park on a driveway and drive in a parkway. So, so when you're reading a recipe and it says a stalk, it's actually just one. So, um, so we're gonna dice up one stalk of celery. I also, when I get celery, I keep the tops. Um, so I'll cut off the tops and save them because this can go back into the uh, seafood stock or chicken broth later on. So again, don't waste food. Um, there's ways to reincorporate things. So we, uh, we have our celery, um, we have our carrots. I have three medium-sized carrots. So I'm just gonna chop these quickly. Um, I don't really peel carrots. I know there's different schools of thought to that. Um, I just give them a really good scrub. So I have a good vegetable scrub brush. So I, um, I like to eat the carrot with the skin. Um, and then what I'll do is I will uh, just do some chopping. I'm gonna just do some small pieces. Oh, sometimes they roll over. Um, as I get to the end, I like to then cut the carrot in half to have smaller pieces. We're gonna get these all ready so that way we can throw them into our stew along with the fish. Um, you can also, as far as not wasting food, um, you can actually keep the tops of carrots and you can actually make a, a pesto sauce with uh, the tops of carrots. So um, if you're ever looking to do something, you don't have basil, you don't wanna waste any food, you can definitely use those carrot tops. So don't throw them away. When you store carrots in the fridge, uh, I actually like to call it my carrot bath. So what you do is you cut the tops off and just keep a little bit of the base of the, the top of the carrot and you put it in a little bath of water. So it's like a hot tub for your carrots. And that actually helps to keep them fresh. Uh, usually with when I do that method, my carrots will last for about like two to three weeks uh, without getting soggy or spoiling. Sometimes you have to change the water a little bit too. Um, so I'm dicing my carrots, thinking about hot tubs and pools. Uh, maybe I'll make pesto. Um, I'm gonna cut this in half. So we're gonna keep dicing the carrots. So again, that was three medium carrots, one stalk, AKA rib of celery. That's like a really good trivia question. So if you wanna impress your friends, you'd be like, did you know that stalks are different than ribs? We have a question about carrots. How do you store them in the water? Upside down or right side up? No, you lay them flat. Oh, okay. So you would actually take, uh, you can get a little a container and you're gonna put the carrots in, lay them flat. Um, and put in some water. So if they're too long for your container, just chop them up. So like little carrot friends. Um, the last thing we're gonna put in our stew as far as veggies before we get to the fish are the potatoes. Um, so usually you can use like one russet, uh, medium russet potato. Uh, these are local organic potatoes from Blue House Farm. They're down in uh, the Pescadero area. Um, I do peel potatoes for stews. Um, if I'm roasting potatoes, I'll keep the skin on. There's a lot of nutrients in there. Um, but I don't like the, the taste of peel in my stew. Um, these I will compost. Um, I suppose if I were really creative, I could do like a potato skin, but um, I'm not that clever. I'm just going to stick with magic and potato, potato arts. Um, potatoes are funny too, because Sometimes they look like little characters. So like, he's like, hello, I'm Mr. Potato Man. Um, 
this is why like I entertain myself just by cooking this is how I uh this is fun I feel like we're in your kitchen I'm seeing a lot of smiles from everybody so it's working so uh we're gonna cut our potato in half I'm like using my iPhone to show these different I need like a high-tech setup but uh this is what I'm doing for now um so I'm gonna just dice my potato uh, so I'll slice it in half and then do some slicing down the middle. Um, I'm going to do a cut down the middle too. I find that helps. And then I group it together and then I do some, just some gentle dicing. And we have our little potato. So you want to have about in total about two cups of potatoes um, overall. And let me show you, so the, uh, let's not forget about the stew. See, I'm talking too much and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a stew going on. So I just want to again, give it a nice stir. Um, the tomato and garlic and leek flavors are just divine. It's, it's really coming together so well. Um, and some of those skins that are on the diced tomatoes are, are breaking down too, so. Um, I'm going to keep dicing my potatoes. By the way, I have a question. Um, well, first, Darm is asking, uh, do you remove the potato eyes? Which is what part of the potato? No, I like keeping the potato eyes. I mean, that's really where like how potatoes grow. Um, when you have potato starts, the, um, they grow out of the eyes. So no, I, I keep the eyes. I'm all about the eyes. I'm all about the, not the skins. Mm, gotcha. Um, so I've got my potatoes going. Uh, any other questions coming in? Um, we are we are good. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm still. And like here, like there's like a little hole in the potato. That's fine. It's just like. This is real food. It's, it's, especially when it comes from our farmers, it's, you know, this is food that was harvested within the last 24 hours being brought to market. So when you buy local, um, foods don't have to sit in uh, transport containers or in uh, trucks or an airplane or ship cargoes. Um, you're generally getting the freshest food. And uh, the fresher the food is, uh, that means peak nutrition. Um, so I, I really like buying uh, fresh and local vegetables. Um, so we're almost done with the potatoes. Um, and what we're gonna do is then we're gonna finish our chopping. And we're gonna then throw in all of our ingredients right into the stew. So uh, let me get my celery that I chopped before. Oops. Um, I think he just muted for a quick second. So I'm going to take a look around to see how everyone is doing. Oh, that's a, okay. Yeah, throwing in our, our celery, our carrots, and our potatoes. It looks so pretty. I know, food should be pretty, and you want to you eat the rainbows. That's how you know that you're getting all of the essential nutrients from our fruits and vegetables. So a mix of dark leafy greens, orange and yellow vegetables. Uh, white potatoes, uh, white mushrooms. Uh, always eat the rainbow to the extent that you can. So we're gonna give everything a good stir. Now we're going to actually partially cover things. So I am gonna put my cover on here as well. Um, so I'm gonna put a cover on here to let it, um, to help trap in most of the heat, but there's a little bit that comes out. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want the stew to become, we don't want too much liquid to evaporate because now we're gonna let it simmer for about 20 to 30 minutes. So because our class is only for an hour, that was one of the things I realized was like, oh no, I picked a recipe that's more than an hour. So we're gonna do some magic because in a few minutes, it's all gonna be done. Um, but now we're gonna get to the main event. You're like, 
wasn't this a seafood class? We haven't talked about seafood. So uh, we're gonna save the best for last and we're gonna talk about our seafood. Um, again, we're letting our soup simmer. So you're gonna lower the heat. So I have it on my uh, electric stove top. It's between like the one and the two. Um, it's gonna simmer for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I find that if you let it go for the full 30 minutes, that's really what helps to get the celery, carrots, and the potatoes really nice, soft, and tender. If you only do 20 minutes, there's gonna be a little bit of a crunch to it. Um, so if you're like, I like crunchy vegetables, 20 minutes. If you're like, I like softer vegetables, 30 minutes. Um, but what we're gonna do is talk about our fish and our seafood. Um, I'm now, what I do is I flip over my cutting board because um, I don't want to prevent cross-contamination. So I have one side I use for veggies and one side that I use for fish and meat. And we're going to talk about our seafood. Um, so what I've done is I have um, three different seafood options. And one thing that's really important is food safety. So I had my plate of seafood. I actually put it on some ice. Um, so I'll put out a bag of ice because I know I get really distracted when I'm cooking. I'm like on the phone, looking at Instagram, checking emails, looking at the stew. So to make sure I don't get anyone sick, I'll put it on some ice um, so it's nice and cold. So there's three different types of uh, fish and seafood so that we're gonna add. And again, this is all what you like and what's available. So uh, tonight we're doing some uh, halibut. This is uh, previously frozen wild Alaskan halibut. We're also doing some fresh albacore tuna. And then we're doing some wild Pacific pink shrimp. Um, you could really do any type of seafood that you like. Um, you know, here in the Bay Area with the Chipino, typically people will put in Dungeness crab. Uh, it's finally Dungeness crab season. I love Dungeness crab, um, but it's a pain in the rear to take apart. And I'm like, this is my first cooking class. I don't want to make a mess out of myself. Um, so we'll save Dungeness crab for like part two. Um, you can also do clams, mussels, um, other types of uh, thin fish as well. So I'm going to talk about the different types of fish that we have and, and how to prepare them. So we're going to start with the halibut. Um, so this is wild Alaskan previously frozen halibut. So what this actually was, so this is from a halibut fish. Um, to ensure that you're doing sustainable seafood, there's really two main uh, authoritative bodies that I go by for what it means to be sustainable. Um, so first is known as the uh, Marine Sustainability Council or MSC. MSC is a nonprofit that actually will certify that particular types of uh, wild fishing practices and fisheries are meeting specific standards. Um, this is really important because there's tremendous overfishing within our, within our planet. Um, overfishing is destroying our oceans, it's destroying our um, natural ecosystems. So it's really important to me that, um, that I purchase um, foods that are uh, caught responsibly um, and that are also not destroying our oceans and the animals and species that live in the oceans. Um, halibut, this is wild. Um, so this is out in the ocean. There is regulation that occurs. Uh, the US based fishing industries are highly regulated as far as specific seasons when fish can be caught, where that fish can be landed. And typically the specific types of fishing methods that are used are sustainable such that they're not destroying other types of animal products. Um, but what I'm gonna do with my halibut, this is about a half a pound of halibut. Um, again, this was uh, frozen at sea, meaning it was caught and bled at sea and then frozen um, and then I thawed it. So I'm gonna take my halibut, let's see if I can get this right. And what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna clean my napkin a bit. Um, and don't worry, my hands are clean for the most part. Um, so I, I do try to keep them clean. Um, so I'm gonna cut it into cubes. So I like to do that first by cutting it into a, about like one inch strips. Um, 
you can see the skins on the back as well. So um, I do like to remove the skin. Uh, if I'm roasting or grilling halibut, I tend to keep the skin on, but for a stew, I prefer to take the skin off. But I keep this because this can go in my seafood stock. So it's a little tough sometimes to get off the end. Um, there you go. I'm gonna turn it back over and then I'm gonna cut it. And then I've got my about one inch cubes approximately. You don't have to measure it. Um, so that's my halibut. So we're gonna eventually put that into the stew. The next thing I'm doing is my, uh, this is wild albacore tuna. So uh, this particular tuna uh, came off the uh, US Pacific coast. Um, this was from a, this is from a local company here uh, called Two by Sea. They're a sustainable fishing company in the Sausalito area. So albacore tuna, this is the tuna that ends up in the cans of tuna, but this is like the actual tuna um, that you see. So it's not ahi tuna, it's not yellow fan tuna, but this is albacore tuna. I love this type of tuna. Um, it's really flavorful. It's very versatile in different types of dishes. Usually it comes in like a really large loin and it's enough. I typically get like three meals out of it. Um, this was about like 1.25 pounds that I had. So I'm gonna now slice my tuna. Um, so typically what I'll do is I'll cut it down the middle. Um, this particular type of tuna as well. Um, so I mentioned before MSC certified. Another type of certifier that we have here is called the Monterey Seafood Watch. So out of the Monterey Aquarium. Um, so I also follow the Monterey Aquarium recommendations for sustainability. So typically I'll focus on products that are known as uh, best choice. Um, Again, you're knowing that there is um, great care for the oceans and other types of species. Um, I'm pulling out some, uh, some bones that are in there. Um, but again, so like I said, there's MSC and then there is uh, Monterey Seafood Watch. Uh, so cutting these into, uh, into pieces about like one and a half, you don't need to have like any specific type of size. It's, um, but I like something that's a little more substantial, so that way you can get it on a spoon. Um, okay, so can we've done- Can you talk a little bit more, if you can now or in a bit, just about the best certifications to make sure that um, you mentioned MSC and best aqua culture practices to make yep. sure you're getting sustainable seafood? Yeah, so what you wanna do is um, typically, so when you're going to either directly to a fisherman's market, a fish shop, um, or a grocery store, um, you'll want to ask the fisher if they are part of any certification program. So the MSC program, um, you'll typically find if it's packaged or at the label, you'll see a blue label that's MSC certified. That's so you know that there's been a certification that's done by a third party to ensure that they are using sustainable practices that are not damaging the oceans. Monterey Seafood Watch, again, is another popular type of certification program that largely focuses on um, preserving both uh, wild fishing practices. Uh, again, that's regulated. Um, then there's also sustainable aquaculture or um, different types of fish farms. So uh, most of our mussels and clams are caught through fish farms, um, a trout, is a very common type of um, fish product that is uh, river trout. Uh, like there's McFarland spring trout, Lassen mountain trout. Um, that is sustainably farmed fish. Um, my general rule of thumb is with, uh, for most fin fish um, that I focus on wild sources. Um, so in particular salmon, I will only eat wild Pacific salmon. Um, I will never eat farmed salmon. Farm salmon is one of the most disgusting types of food products. Um, the way that fish farming works for a product like salmon, um, there are some places I think in New Zealand where I think they have sustainable methods, but um, the way that the, the fish are farmed, um, there's 
there's issues like sea lice. Um, there, there's so many issues that are just, um, I, I, I wouldn't personally eat it. Um, it also, some people I see in the chat don't like the taste of it. Um, but for most type of uh, fin fish products, I prefer wild, um, it's sustainable. But you also wanna make sure you're looking at the uh, MSC or Monterey Seafood Watch. I think Seattle has their own certification too. Um, there might be others on the East Coast as well. And the last ingredient that we're gonna throw into our, um, our stew is shrimp. Um, so this is a uh, pink shrimp caught off the coast of Oregon. And again, I, I pretty much only eat shrimp that is uh, wild shrimp. Um, much of the shrimp that we find at the grocery store or packaged often is farm shrimp that's coming from um, places like Thailand and Vietnam. Um, there are so many issues with the shrimp industry, everything coming from, uh, uh, there's uh, slave labor that's involved in shrimping practices. Uh, where people are coerced into slave labor to work or trafficked and then work on shrimp boats. As far as um, just again, uh, damage to uh, oceans and natural habitats. Um, so again, I, I only eat wild shrimp. Um, here in California, I eat shrimp that's off the Pacific. If you're in the Southeast, there's really great sustainable shrimp um, from the Gulf of, uh, from there's, you'll hear Gulf shrimp. Um, but I'm really, really careful about the types of shrimp that I buy. Um, I pretty much only buy shrimp that have the, um, have the shells still on it. Um, Cause then I can choose how to, how I process it and what I'm gonna do with it. It's also really important that um, if you wanna save some money, typically shrimp that has the shells on um, tends to be a little bit cheaper on average because if the manufacturer or the fisher is taking the, the tails off um, or the shells off, you're gonna pay more for that. So, um, so the way that you're actually going to uh, take off the tails um, and the shells. So first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna remove the legs. So you're gonna pull them off. There's a lot of like tools on the market. I don't know, I just think like, just use your hands. Um, you don't need all these gadgets and gizmos. So um, we're gonna pull off the shrimp. And then uh, some people use a fork to take the shell off, but again, just I think just use your fingers. So we're gonna crack the shell a little bit and take it off. Um, and again, I keep my shrimp shells because I pop them in the freezer and then you can save them for another time um, for um, for making a seafood stock. I'm also going to de-vein the shrimp and I gotta get my little, my little knife. So, so the way you're gonna de-vein the shrimp, so that, so we're not cardiologists here. These aren't like blood veins. So the, the vein of the shrimp is actually the digestive tract. So what you're gonna do is just do like a little slice along the back of the shrimp. So I just slice it back that way. This one was a little deeper and you'll see like back in there, that's, that's the vein, that's the digestive tract. So uh, you can just go and pull it out. Um, I tend to remove the vein. Um, some people don't, but I, I just prefer to take it out. Um, so I take that out. So I'm gonna do that to all of my shrimp and uh, then we're gonna chop them up. So Julia, how are we doing on time? We're good. We're at we're at an hour, but it's okay. If folks have to drop, we are recording, so we'll send this to everybody. Or if you have a magic trick, um, whatever uh, works works for you. Yeah. Okay. So what we're gonna do? Um, so I have a bunch of the shrimp. Um, so I'm gonna keep taking the shells off. Um, but again, you can use like pretty much any type of seafood product. So um, clams are great. Uh, crab. Um, Today we have the halibut and the uh, albacore tuna. You could use other types of tuna. You could use um, salmon. Um, I find that like a, a little bit of like a, a thicker fish is better. Something like a petrali sole 
while I love eating petrali sole, I think it's a little too thin for a, for a stew. So I want something that's a little thicker. Um, but um, the clams and uh, mussels are always a great option. <laughs> so we're gonna keep taking the veins out. Uh, scallops are great too. Um, but I tend to, you know, for me, for sustainability and eating locally and seasonally, I focus on West Coast uh, Pacific seafood. Um, fish coming from uh, Alaska is, is some of the most sustainable fish in the country, um, along with fish coming off the coast of Washington and Oregon and California. Um, so I'm going to keep doing my shrimp. Let's see, we have a couple questions. People are very impressed by your technique, so way to go. Um, we wish okay. you were your neighbor. <laughs> um, let's see, did you talk about clams at all or scallops? Um, your scallops, yeah. scallops are a great fit. Um, little neck clams also I think would be great too. Um, you know, you wanna make sure, generally if you're buying clams um, that you get them, that they're live. Um, and then you're going to cook them directly in the um, directly in the stew. Uh, I mean, you can get clams that are canned. You know, it's not going to have the same amount of flavor as it would. But um, that's definitely an option. Um, as far as the issue of like wild versus farmed for um, for shellfish. So for uh, mussels. Um, for oysters, we have a lot of oyster farms here. So absolutely, most of what you're gonna get for uh, mussels and oysters and clams will often be uh, through aquaculture, through, uh, through fish farming. Um, but again, those are generally, you wanna make sure that they're using sustainable practices, that they're not using um, types of methods that would be harmful to the oceans and our ecosystems. So uh, you could look at the uh, MSC, uh, to see what's out there, as well as go and look at the um, uh, Monterey Seafood Watch. But again, like focus on what you have available seasonally. So, you know, if you're in the New England, uh, lobster in a S2 is delicious. Um, we only have spiny lobster here in the Pacific, which I think is fine. It, it's not the same as the, as the New England lobster, but, um, but I, I do prefer to eat things that are caught and um, landed and travel locally because the shorter the distance between farm or ocean to your plate, uh, the less greenhouse gases that are emitted. So you're helping to reduce your carbon footprint by uh, eating locally and close to home. Or better yet, get a fishing permit and go out and do your own fishing for the day. Uh, growing your own food or catching your own food is uh, one of the most sustainable ways uh, to live. So Thomas is asking about freshwater fish. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, again, if you're looking at um, for freshwater fish, if it's coming from lakes, um, it, it, yes, it very well can be sustainable. But again, I would just, I think it's important as, as consumers and eaters to just do a little bit of research um, about where the fish is coming from um, and just to learn about their uh, fishing practices. Okay, so I finished with all my shrimp. Um, I've removed all the digestive tracts. Ew, isn't that gross? But it's all part of, it's part of the circle of the ocean, the circle of life. So I finished, um, I finished chopping everything. I, I think I did it. Um, so what we're gonna do is, so typically, so in the interest of time, um, we'll probably just cut to the end. Um, I think that it maybe has been about 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to try my carrots uh, and see how soft they are. But it's looking really good. So, but I'm going to do some tasting. It's really good to taste the food as you eat. Let's see if it's tender. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, I like it. It could probably go for like a few more minutes, but 
what we're going to do now. So the final part, so fish and seafood cooks really quickly. Um, so our finishing touch is that we're going to turn up the heat. So we're going to make it hot. So I've, I've made my heat pretty high and we're going to actually throw all the seafood. It's like, whee! it's like a little, oh, did I not get this cut up hard enough? We're just going to toss them in. We're going to cook it on high heat for about two to three minutes, uncovered. So we're just tossing them in. And that's it? That's all you need to cook the seafood? That's like- About three minutes. Wow. Um, this is, I think is like one of the most effective ways to cook seafood. Um, we're also going to add in some uh, fresh chopped parsley. This was actually from my garden. So I'm gonna uh, chop it a little bit. I love parsley, it really brings out some rich flavors. Uh, we're gonna do the little rocking method, just again, like I did with the garlic to chop the parsley. Throw that in there. Do a little bit more parsley chopping. All right, we're gonna give a little stir. Again, it's um, it's uncovered. So you can see like this beautiful mix of local sustainable seafood, local organic vegetables. Um, so about three minutes in total. So you can see it's getting a nice bubble. Because you're chopping it, um, it really helps the fish to stew evenly. So like when you're cooking fish in an oven or on a grill or in a pan, you're only cooking it one side at a time. So when you put it in the stew, everything cooks evenly. So it's just, it's, I think it's one of like the most effective ways to cook. Um, and you'll know that it's done because you'll see like, here's, here's the tuna, it's, it's turning white. Um, if you have, um, if you had other seafood products like clams or mussels, you would throw them in too. Um, if you're using crab, oftentimes crab is, is already sold when it's cooked. So you would just put it in towards the very end. Um, So I'm looking at it, the shrimp looks good. I always like to check. Um, it looks pretty good. I'm feeling good about this. Um, so I'm gonna take it off the heat. Um, the fish also, even though like it's only two to three minutes, it's going to keep cooking while it's in the soup, in the stew. There's that magic again. Um, so, it will keep cooking. So it's just keep that in mind too. And you don't want to overcook fish because then it gets kind of dried out and really too chewy. But the last thing that we're going to do um, when you remove from the heat, I got to get my, um, my lemon. Um, so the last thing that you do to put into your stew is some uh, fresh lemon. Um, I'm going to do a little squeeze, about half a lemon. Try to not get the seeds in there. I took them out beforehand. Um, Lemon and seafood and tomato and garlic are all like a great pairing. Um, so I added in the lemon, I'm gonna stir it up. And that's it. We have our seafood stew. Wow. Um, what if someone is doing clams? Can they put it in at the same time as the other fish? Um, I would maybe put them a little earlier. Um, I mean, if they're live clams, I would maybe put them in a little bit sooner before the, the other fish. You know, typically like in this real recipe, if this would have played out, you would let it simmer for 30 minutes. Um, 
turn the heat up high, put in the clams first, um, and then uh, add in the other fish as well. Um, the last thing I like to do is add a little bit of hot sauce. Um, so this is one of our local hot sauce makers, uh, Scott, Lucky Dog. This is, um, a, it's called Heats of Peach. It's a uh, Trinidad scorpion hot sauce with peaches and roasted garlic. Um, I do about like half a teaspoon in it. Um, you can do as much as you want to taste. And um, I don't really measure things. I'm just like, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Always remember like you can always make things more hot or more salty. So always start with less and then add more. Um, and that's it. Um, there's your seafood stew. So I, I tend to serve it right away. Um, this also uh, stores great for leftovers. So um, you tend to make, this is about like, you know, about four to six servings, whatever you don't eat, uh, you can put in the fridge. I also freeze it for more. Um, and then um, the other thing I, I'm not gonna make tonight, but what you could also do is have, um, or maybe I will make later, but uh, slice some uh, a baguette uh, so I got a local sourdough baguette, slice it, add some um, olive oil on both sides, salt and pepper, put the stove on for about 350, pop it in the stove, and then you'll have some uh, homemade crostini that you can dip into your, into your stew. So you can sop up all the, the yumminess. Yeah. And there you go. Good stew. So sorry I went a little over, but you got a magic show. So I think it's worth it. Definitely. Um, and now I'm gonna taste it. Let's see. So I wish like everyone could taste it. Like here, have a bite. Oh, I know this is we were in the comments. We're like smell a vision. We wish people could come over. We were your neighbors. Yes. Oh, um, so it's like the the um, the fish is tender. It's meaty. It's flavorful and it's, it's warm. This is a really satisfying dish. So when you're like, you know, it was a long day of work and you're like, I've done, you know, I'm going to listen to sad songs, but then I'm going to pick myself up with some seafood stew. So bon appetit. Totally. We love it. Um, Jane and Stan have a question. Oh, we did. Oh, no, I don't think we, oh, do we? Oh, you had your hand raised. Oh, the knives, yes. Oh, you that wanted was, to talk, what are your knives? What do you recommend? Yeah, that, that knife that you were using looked great. Okay, so this is called, um, this is a Japanese knife. It's uh, called Global. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember where we got this from, but um, they have a set. And um, anyway, yeah, I, I definitely like this particular brand. Um, global. Yeah, Global, highly recommend it. Okay, great. Thank you. It looks wonderful. Thank you. The great class. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for the advice. We have honorary product placement. Um, <laughs> I want to see if we can spotlight a few folks who've been cooking along. So Sandra, I know you're cooking. I think Janet might be. So I'm just going to add some spotlights. Please let me know in the comments or unmute. If you have been cooking and you want to share, I was looking for Janet, if you're able to uh, come back on. Oh, here you are. Just let us know how, how's it going? Anything you want to share or show us? Oh, here she comes, bringing it over. I see it, I see it. <laughs> Ooh. I haven't put the seafood in yet because okay. I'm going to put clams in it and my potatoes aren't uh, ready enough. So I'm going to wait for the potatoes to get done. Yeah, that looks great. Jen. So how do how long should I let the I have the little neck cramp clams. So how long should I let them cook before I put the other seafood in? Well, I don't usually cook with little neck clams, so I'm not entirely sure. But um. Maybe just a few minutes. Just a, not to, not until they open, just a few minutes before well, the seafood. Usually they will open. Um, okay. But I'll put them in for a few more minutes. Remember, cooking okay. while um, in the stews. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Amazing job. And Janet, your presentation. Woo. That's gorgeous. 
Is it steaming up the camera? <laughs> You're on mute. We can't hear you if you if you remember to unmute. Oh, you had it for a second. Um, just gonna give me one more minute. There you go. Yes, it's steaming up the camera. Wow. <laughs> and so we've got your your um starter bakery baguettes with some fresh gremolata on top. So that's just because we just used a little bit of parsley for the garnish, we just whipped that up in the little food processor with some olive oil, some garlic, the zest of the lemon that we were using from the lemon squeeze, and some red pepper flakes. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much. We can't wait to see your pictures on Instagram. Um, so just a reminder to tag us, to tag Andy, the Agricultural Institute of Marin, AIM. We'll put all those links in our follow-up email when we send out the recording. And then just also as we're kind of wrapping up here, I, I put the link again. If folks would consider donating, we would be grateful and really appreciate it. Andy, can you tell us what people's gifts are going towards in their contributions? Sure. So the gifts tonight are supporting our youth for food access programs. So we, we want to create a world where all people can access healthy, locally grown foods. We recognize that, um, that price points can be a barrier. So our year in campaign or your donation help to support our programs like uh, the Bounty Box and Roll and Root and our uh, EBT programs where we provide healthy local foods to our community members who are working to make ends meet. And that helps to feed our communities. And also 100% of that goes right back to our farm fishers. Or it means a lot for our programs. Awesome. Thank you for the great work you lead and um, really sharing your, your story and your cooking with us. I'm just going to take a quick look to see if anyone has a final question. Otherwise, we will we will wrap up. Any final thoughts or questions? Or Andy, you want to add anything before I give our closing remarks? No, just um, thanks for supporting us. Check out our website, agriculturalinstitute.org. Shop your farmer's market um, and just have fun with cooking. Don't worry about the recipes or the ingredients. Just have fun and explore. So. <laughs> I love it. Such great advice. Uh, put all the spices in, have fun um, and support local. Yep. all things we can get behind. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We will send out the recording. We appreciate any support that you're able to give from you know $5 to 15 to more if you're able to. Um, and also consider supporting your local farmer's market. I know that many of us might not live in this area, but uh, pay it forward and, and care for others around you. That's really what Tradition Kitchens is all about. So we are volunteer led, which means all of our classes are organized and taught by people in our, in our network. If any of you wanna teach, we'd love to have you in 2022. So please reply to um, the email that goes out and let us know. We are collecting quotes to know what Tradition Kitchens means to you. So um, we'll ask you to fill out a few words if you wanna share and uh, be able to celebrate how it's impacted you, we hope this year and last year. And finally, we have one last class, which is on Friday, and you'll get that in your email. It's also on our, on our social media, but we are going to be doing a live cooking demo from Vietnam, where Na will be teaching some unique dishes and giving us a tour of her vegetable village. So we're really looking forward to it. With that, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon, evening, morning, depending on what you're calling in from. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Yes, please stay safe and healthy out there. And thanks again, Andy. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>